ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين I'm extremely extremely happy once again to be here in Dudley and mashallah tabarakallah every time I I come here, I see, mashallah, the, the effort of the brothers and mashallah, tabarakallah, such a large place and, and it's starting to get used more. People are starting to, to really get involved in the masjid and that's something which is really, really pleasing to see. It's something that's very pleasing to see where we are now coming up to the month of Ramadan because we hope, inshallah, this will only increase in the month of Ramadan. And there will be even more people here and even more people making use of this fantastic facility that is a ni'mah from the ni'am, from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And insha'Allah ta'ala, we hope and we encourage the brothers that this is going to continue after Ramadan. And I'm, I believe you've heard a few words on this topic, but it doesn't hurt to repeat the words again and to emphasize to you guys how important it is that Ramadan is not a peak followed by a trough but that Ramadan is a peak that continues and continues and continues such that every Ramadan that comes is better than the last and the month that follows it, uh, whether that be Shawwal or the following months, you see within it that you are increasing yourself, you're building upon what you've done in Ramadan and you're continuing inshaAllah ta'ala to play an active role in the masjid with the facilities that you have and inshaAllah with the brothers and the sisters that are around you. Our topic today, after praising Allah and sending salutations upon the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon his family and his companions, is the topic of the fiqh of Ramadan. And I think it's important that we just define for ourselves for a moment what we mean by the word fiqh. And the word fiqh in the Arabic language, it means understanding comprehension, to really understand something and to have detailed knowledge of something. And this is found in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wants good for, he gives him fiqh in the religion. He gives him understanding of the religion. And the meaning of fiqh here isn't that he gives him the fiqh as in the book of fiqh or he gives him the fiqh of the prayer or the fiqh of Ramadan but that he gives him understanding of the religion he gives him knowledge and the ability to act upon it and that's what we want to get out of today inshallah ta'ala it's not for us to mention all of the difficult things and then to confuse people and to say the Malikiya said and the Shafi'iya said and the Hanabila said and the Hanafiya said and the Zahiriya said and this said and that said that's not what we want to do today what we want to do today is to get people to understand the month of Ramadan, to understand when it starts and when it finishes, to understand when the day begins and when the day ends, to understand who should be fasting and who shouldn't be fasting, to understand what breaks the fast and what continues the fast, to understand the essence of the fast. Both those things that are obligatory and those things that are optional. And the purpose of us understanding the fast is so that we can act upon what we know. And the best action in terms of learning Islam is that you learn something before you need it. So, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, the time for learning whether or not your fast breaks is not the first day after Ramadan. That's a problem. If you get to the first day or the second day and you say, I'm diabetic and I need injections or I'm like this or I take medicine or I have a heart condition I have this, I do this, I don't know when does it begin, when, when is Fajr, when does Fajr end, all of the different timings, has Ramadan started. 
the, the time for this is before Ramadan. So insha'Allah ta'ala we're doing good by discussing these issues before we need them so that we can implement them properly when the month of Ramadan comes. The first thing that I want to mention is actually not uh, specifically related to Ramadan but more so discussing uh, what comes before Ramadan and specifically discussing the 15th of Sha'ban which of course many people single out as a time for specific acts of worship and it's very important that we understand that there are various different types of bid'ah or innovation in Islam and from the types of innovation that exist in Islam are specifying an act of worship in a particular way or at a particular time that the Prophet ﷺ didn't used to do. So giving a particular day or a particular time for worship or worshipping in a particular way or a particular manner that the Prophet ﷺ didn't used to do. And we know that regardless of the disagreement in the scholars of hadith over the authenticity of what is narrated regarding the 15th of Sha'ban, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for performing any act of worship on that night or in the day. Not for fasting the month that day, nor for praying during that night. And this is important to mention, even if uh, it's maybe not an issue for people sitting here today, but we mention it anyways, inshallah ta'ala, perhaps it will benefit people uh, come next year or it will benefit some people who come to watch the lecture on the internet inshallah ta'ala so we just remind people that regardless of whether or not there is anything north authentically narrated about this night then there is certainly nothing narrated about acts of worship to be performed during the day or in the night and we know that one of the types of innovation that the Prophet ﷺ warned us about and he said every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance is in the hellfire as is reported by Imam al-Nasa'i with this wording and by the other companions of the six books with different wordings that all innovation is misguidance and all misguidance is in the hellfire. So we must be very careful that we do not specify acts of worship at certain times or it's certain ways that the Prophet ﷺ did not used to do. Now we come to the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And the first thing that we really need to talk about before we talk about fasting at all is how we determine when the month of Ramadan begins and indeed when the month of Ramadan ends. What we want to do to begin with is to make something very, very, very clear. There are a number of different opinions regarding how we determine the beginning of Ramadan. But what we want to do is to take one of those opinions out and completely put it to the side. Because it is one of the opinions that we can openly say is falsehood. And this opinion that we can openly say is falsehood is the opinion of calculating the beginning of Ramadan using scientific instruments or charts or knowledge of the stars or any other method. This is absolute batil. And alhamdulillah, there are some types of disagreement that we can say are genuine and we can have respect for the people who hold them. And there are some kinds that are absolute falsehood. And we warn against them and we warn against the people who spread them amongst the ummah. And from the worst of these, or from amongst the worst of these that relate to Ramadan is the opinion that Ramadan should be calculated scientifically or through the stars and the charts and so on and so forth. And I'm going to explain to you why this is such a problem. And the, for example, typifying this is the website moonsighting.com where they ridicule those people who spot the moon by their eyes and they claim that your fasting is not correct and they make you doubt the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan. These shayateen who spread this message into the ummah, they only seek to make you doubt in your deen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will complete his religion even if the disbelievers hate it. 
So subhanAllah, there is a real, you know, a real movement at the moment to ridicule those people who follow the sunnah with the regard to the beginning and the end of Ramadan. And to make them say that their methods are no more than the methods of ignorant Bedouins and fools who don't know any difference and have no knowledge. And this is what they would make you think about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Rather, this is what they would make you think about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained to us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. And this hadith is narrated by Sahih in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Fast when you see it and break your fast when you see it, i.e. when you see the moon. And in another hadith, the Prophet Wasallam said, we are an ummah that does not calculate, or the wording to that effect. We are an ummah that does not calculate. We are an ummah that is illiterate. We do not calculate. We are an ummah who every single Muslim in this ummah is able to determine the beginning of the Ramadan and the end of Ramadan. But these people would restrict the beginning and the end of Ramadan to a handful of individuals who have the right technology or the right degree or the right PhD to be able to tell you. Alhamdulillah, our religion is not like this. Our religion is open to everybody and Ramadan is not stopped from being understood by anybody. So Alhamdulillah, anyone is able to determine the beginning and the end of Ramadan by their sight and by learning the shapes of the moon and when the new moon begins. One of the clearest evidences that this opinion is absolute falsehood is the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim as well. And it's very, very important that you understand this. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you are prevented from seeing it, i.e. by the clouds, then uh, estimate the length of the month as 30 days. Okay, 30 days. Why is this so clear that it refutes the idea of calculating? Because, let us imagine for a second, that we, that it's cloudy one day and we can't see the moon. If it's cloudy and we can't see the moon, then the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to fast 30 days. We know for a fact that the clouds don't stop the moon from coming. Right? The clouds don't stop the moon from coming. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying to you, the new moon is there, but the clouds are stopping you from seeing it. Fa prevent or delay your fast by a day or extend your Ramadan by a day. So he's clearly saying that regardless of whether the moon is there or not there, if you can see it or if you can't, you can, then you, fa you begin your fasting or you finish your fasting at the end of the month. And if you can't see it, even though it's there, then you continue your fasting. And this is because this issue is what we call ta'abbudi. Let me give you a simple example. When you make wudu, you wash your hands and your mouth and your nose and your face and your arms, you wipe over your head and your ears and you wash your feet. Let's imagine someone has just done that and their water is dripping from their feet as we speak. It's still dripping from his beard. It's still dripping water. And then he breaks wind. Tell me why does he wash his hands again and his mouth and his nose and his face and his arms and wipe over his head and wash his feet? When the place where he broke wind from he doesn't wash, and why does he wash his hands when his hands are dripping wet with water? Because this issue of wudu is ta'abbudi. Allah is testing your obedience to him. He is not scientifically testing whether or not you have broken wudu in this way or that. He is testing your obedience to him. He is not, it is not a matter of science. Because science, you cannot explain to me how a person can break wind and then wash his hands again. It doesn't make any sense. It's ta'abbudi. It's there to test your obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. Likewise, the sight of the moon is something which is ta'abbudi. It's there to test your obedience to Allah. It doesn't matter scientifically whether it's there or it's not there. It's there to test your obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. To test whether you're going to obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or disobey the Messenger. There are certain things in Islam that are related to physical, scientific, 
uh, actions. But a lot of the actions in Islam are there not for their scientific merit, but they are there to test your obedience to Allah from your disobedience. So in this way, we don't really care whether the moon scientifically is there or not. We care only about what the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to do. If you see it, then fast. And if you don't see it, then continue the month 30 days. Once we've thrown that as opinion aside, we now come to three opinions which are genuine and bona fide opinions regarding the sighting of the moon and how we determine whether the month of Ramadan has begun or not. The first of those is that every Muslim community is responsible for their own moon sighting. Every Muslim community is responsible for their own moon sighting. The evidence that they use for this is the hadith that we mentioned, when you see it fast. And so they said that this refers to the local community of Muslims or to the uh, commanding person who is ruling the Muslims in that particular area. So if the moon, according to this opinion, is seen in Indonesia, but it is not seen in England then according to this opinion, the people in England do not fast and the people in Indonesia fast because they have seen it as the Prophet ﷺ commanded and we have not seen it, so we do not fast. That is one opinion. The second opinion is the opposite. The second opinion says that wherever the moon is reliably sighted in the Muslim world, and I say reliably, so not those countries that decide the moon sighting politically or those countries that decide the moon sighting because we have to be different from the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia or those Muslims who decide the moon sighting on anything else, but those who decide it reliably. They have a reliable system for watching the moon, then wherever in the world it is seen, they begin. And the evidence they use for this is they say that the Prophet ﷺ, as the commander of all of the Muslims, he would determine the beginning of Ramadan based on the testimony. Of course, he could only get testimony from the local area because they didn't have mobile phones and you know the internet and so on and so forth. So they couldn't communicate over long distances. And they say that it's important for the Muslims to be united for Ramadan to begin on a single day. And the third opinion is to say that the uh, moon sighting is to be, we are to take one country and to use that country as a template or as a center by which all the other Muslims can follow. And usually it's suggested that that country be Saudi Arabia. Now, one thing I'm going to say to you about these three different opinions is that none of them are free from criticism. All of them have problems with them in this world today. All of them have problems with them in this world today. If we take the issue of Saudi Arabia, what do you do if you can see the moon as plain as I can see you and you can see me here today and Saudi Arabia is not fasting? So that has a problem with it. Likewise, all of the Muslims in the world getting together, the issue is, does this contradict the hadith? Fast when you see it and withhold when you see it. And the second issue is, how do we reliably determine when the moon is seen there or when the moon is seen here when so many people do not sight the moon properly? The third issue also has a problem because you have the problem of defining where is a community. For example, if I am sitting in Medina, and I can see the moon, and someone in Riyadh can't see the moon, should they fast or not fast? This opinion also has issues with it. So all three of them have issues of criticism. What I'm going to advise you guys to do is I'm going to say to you that it really doesn't matter which of the three opinion, opinions are followed. All of them have an evidence and all of them have equal options for criticism with them. But what you must do, or what my advice to you to do, is for you to follow whatever system your local masjid has adapted. So that your local masjid, you can all fast together on the same day and you can all break your fast together on the same day. So if your local masjid follows Saudi Arabia, that's no problem with that. They have their fatawa, they have some of the scholars who support this and this is their decision. If they follow local sighting only, meaning wherever it's seen in Birmingham, they follow that, no problem. If they follow wherever it's seen in England, no problem. If they follow wherever it's seen in the Muslim world, 
no problem. At the end of the day, all of these opinions have issues and, and criticisms that can be made, and none of them seem to suit our circumstances in the Ummah with us all being broken up without a single leader and a single uh, system of command. We all have, there are issues with all of them. And all of them have their evidences. So what I would say to you is, in order to keep the Muslims together, in order to make yourselves, uh, if you like, uh, not blameworthy in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, whatever your local masjid does that is genuine, as long as your local masjid is genuine. Alhamdulillah, this masjid we believe and we're certain that inshallah they are genuine when it comes to the sighting of the moon. If you attend a masjid who you know for a fact they meet two months before Ramadan and say, right, when would it be good for the shops to be open for Eid? Shops should be open on a Saturday. Okay, Ramadan is on a Friday. If you know your masjid does this, you can't follow them. Because you know for certain that their method is absolutely not permissible. But if they use one of the three genuine methods, either they say wherever it's cited in Britain, or they say wherever it's cited in the Muslim world reliably, or they go by a single place or a single country, and they make that the place where if it's cited, they fast, and if it's not, they don't, then inshallah, they have their opinion, and they have their evidence, and they have their dalil. So we would say that in order to keep the community together, let the people follow the reliable method that is used by the local masjid. And this, inshallah ta'ala, will bring the community, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, together, and help the people so we don't have a situation where a son is fasting, and a father is breaking his fast, and so on and so forth. However, there is one issue to this, which is that you yourself cannot, and this is from the fiqh of Ramadan, you cannot deny what your own eyes see. So if you go outside and you know the sightings of the moon and the shapes of the moon, and you're certain of them and you know what they are, and you go outside and you see the moon and you are certain of it, and you tell your local masjid and the imam says, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. Or I'm sorry, we don't follow that. What are you going to do? You as an individual are going to fast. You as an individual are going to fast. Because it's not allowed for you to know something with, with uh, ghalabat al dhan that you know something predominantly or, or preponderantly, or all you're sure that this is the moon you've seen, for you to then not fast. But what you're going to do is you're going to fast, but you're not going to cause a fitna in the community by announcing it on the mimbar and by making a fight with the imam and so on and so forth. You're just going to fast yourself uh, privately with yourself and not uh, impose that upon anybody else. So this is a case when it doesn't really happen in this country because in this country we are blessed with uh, a lot of cloudy weather. But subhanAllah, it happens in some places that the imam announces something and with your own eyes you see the hilal yourself, you see the moon yourself, then it's not permissible for you to go against what your own eyes have seen. You must begin the fast. If you see, you must break the fast. But when you do so, you must do so quietly and without causing trouble in the local community. So without making a, a two teams of people, one people who follow you and one people who follow someone else, but you do it privately. Likewise, somebody may begin fasting in Pakistan. And he comes to England and they began fasting a day later. When the day of Eid comes, what happens? People in England are fasting 30 days. What's the problem there? He began a day earlier. And the people in England are fasting 30 days. It's haram for him to fast 31 days. We know for a fact Ramadan is 29 or 30. So what does he do? He breaks his fast privately himself, away from the eyes of the people. He breaks his fast. He eats his food. But he doesn't celebrate Eid. He celebrates Eid with the people all together. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-fitru yawma, yawma yuftiru nas That fitr is on the day when the people Eid al-fitr is on the day when the people celebrate Eid al-fitr I.e. when your whole community comes together to celebrate Eid That is the day when you should be celebrating Eid So what we say to the person is You can't fast 31 days So if you started in another country And you come here Then what you do is you eat But you don't eat in front of the people You eat privately on your own and you just wait and you celebrate Eid a day later with all the people together. And that's only for the person who would be fasting uh, 31 days. As for the one who 
began a day early in Pakistan and then they celebrate Eid on the after the 29th day, there's no problem. He can fast his whole 30 days and then do Eid. But the problem is when you do 31 days, you can't, you can't fast 31 days in length. So if it comes to the 31st day, you must break your fast, even if the other people are fasting, but you break it in private and you break it away from the eyes of the people. And then when the people celebrate Eid, you come and you celebrate Eid together with everybody. So this is the issue of the moon sighting, the beginning and the end. Now we come to the issue of the timing and the day and the intention. So the first thing is that we have to know is that no fast is accepted without an intention. So we have to make our intention to begin the fast in Ramadan. The question comes, do we have to make intention every day or is it enough for us to make intention once at the beginning of the month? Insha'Allah Ta'ala, the correct opinion and the one that seems to be closer to the truth is that you can make intention once as long as you are fasting continuously. But if you break your fast for any reason, such as sickness or traveling or any other reason that you have to break your fast, then if you break your fast, you must make intention again to fast from the following day and your intention of course must be before the fast begins it must be before the fast begins and by intention you don't have to say any particular words you don't have to make any particular statement but your intention what does it mean it means that if someone was to stop you and say to you what are you doing tomorrow you would say tomorrow I'm going to fast as for someone who had no clue that it was Ramadan never never had any idea Example, a new Muslim. And that new Muslim becomes Muslim during the day, let's say at 10 o'clock in the, in the 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, then this person has not made the intention to fast the night before because he didn't know that he was going to fast Ramadan that day. And so that person can refrain from eating with people, but it doesn't count as one of his days and he needs to make up the day uh, when it follows. He needs to make up the day after the month of Ramadan. So we're all clear that we know about the intention. It's enough for you to make intention to fast Ramadan. And intention is important because you guys need to make intention between Maghrib and Fajr. And sometimes people might go to sleep and forget to do it. So it's important to know that you can have your intention for the whole month of Ramadan. You don't have to think, right, tomorrow I'm going to fast, tomorrow I'm going to fast. It's enough for you to make it for the whole month of Ramadan. But if you do break your fast for any reason, sickness or traveling, then once again, come Maghrib, you must make intention that between Maghrib and Fajr, that when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to be fasting. And that's just simply a realization in your heart. A realization in your heart. And it does apply, even though it might sound strange, it does apply. Sometimes you're traveling and you think, oh, am I going to reach home or not reach home? And you reach home and 10 minutes after Fajr began. And if you didn't intend to fast, then you don't, then you don't uh, fast on that day. Yeah, so you have to have your intention to fast. And that intention needs to be made between Maghrib and Fajr. And when you make it, you can make it for the whole month of Ramadan as long as you don't stop fasting. So that gives you uh, a, a good uh, idea of the issue of the intention. Now we come to the issue of when do you begin fasting and when do you conclude fasting. Of course, we begin fasting at the Adhan of Fajr, or at the time of Fajr. And obviously, I think everyone knows, but we have to make clear for everyone, especially because the video might later be seen by someone who's not Muslim, for example, that when we say Fajr, we're not talking about sunrise. Because a lot of people say this in English. They say Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset. Of course, we all know that we don't fast from sunrise to sunset. We fast from dawn until sunset. Or, and dawn, or the particular dawn we are talking about, comes a long time before sunset, before sunrise, about an hour and a half or so. So we're looking at uh, Fajr time until, uh, you, until uh, the sun sets at Maghrib. With regard to Fajr time, you'll notice that at least in Newcastle, the Fajr time differs amongst the different masajid. Again, my advice would be, uh, genuinely, two things. Generally, go with your local masjid. You know, again, you know, at the end of the day, everyone in your local masjid is going to be eating together. Go with your local masjid. But also use your brain a little bit. 
There are some times for Fajr that you go outside and it's light as day and the people are still eating inside. This, I don't know about Birmingham, but this happens in Newcastle. So if you find that the time is way off and it's obviously off, by looking at the sky, you come out and it's, the sun's up in the sky and everyone's still eating, then you know that this time needs to be changed and you need to you know, stop eating a little earlier. But as long as the time is vaguely, you know, and you, you, do, you go by what your local masjid, where you have your iftar and you, have your, you pray, so that you can get everyone together, eating together at the same time uh, and breaking their fast together at the same time, inshallah ta'ala. So it's not a major issue about these differences in times, but do use your brain a little bit. If you do, I know there are some masajid who break their, who start fasting about an hour after we stop fasting. And when you go outside, it's light as day. So you can see that this time is clearly off. It's clearly not, not it's clearly, the time is clearly not the right time to be uh, eating. So use your brain a little bit. But in general, you go with your local masjid and that's enough for you, inshallah ta'ala. And it's an evidence for you because you're not required to come to the conclusion of every issue in Islam. It's enough for you to refer it to people of knowledge. And in the masjid, there are people of knowledge who have determined the time of Fajr. And so you're okay to follow their timings. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. What you shouldn't be doing really is looking for the later time so that you can, okay, I'm gonna go with this masjid because it gives me half an hour extra to eat or something like that. Because this is not really very sincere and it's not based on knowledge. You're just looking for an easy way out of things. But you go with whatever your local masjid decides, inshallah, as long as what they decide is within the realm of what is acceptable Islamically. First of all, when we begin about talking about fasting itself, we should talk about the ruling of fasting. And the ruling of fasting, of course, is that it is fardu ayn. It is an individual obligation upon who? Upon everyone who does not have an excuse. It's an individual obligation upon everyone who does not have an excuse. What do we mean by everyone who does not have an excuse? Of course, they must be Muslim and they must have reached puberty and they must be uh, sane in terms of sane, sane of mind. And then, of course, we look for excuses. And there are a number of excuses that prevent a person from, uh, from uh, uh, fasting. So the first thing we said is that if a person is Muslim, if they are, have reached the age of puberty, if they are, uh, if they are set of sound mind, then that person is required to fast the month of Ramadan as long as they don't have an excuse. And we know that there are a number of reasons why people have excuses, uh, such as traveling, which we're going to talk about in detail, such as menses and child uh, bleeding after childbirth, which we're going to talk about as well. And we know that there are a number of other things like illnesses, and we're going to talk about those and how we make up for those as well. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Let's begin, first of all, by dealing with traveling. I'm going to try and make it as easy for you guys as I possibly can with regard to the issue of traveling. The first thing we're going to have to talk about for traveling is what do we mean by traveling? What is traveling? Okay? And you, there are two ways for you to think about this. One is to say that traveling is approximately going more than about 40 miles, 35 to 40 miles. And I just want you to keep that in your mind as a rough estimate. So 30, more than 35 or 40 miles distance, roughly this is one of the opinions for traveling. Another opinion, and this is probably the more correct in terms of the sunnah, is that traveling is what is known by the people as traveling. For example, if you were to go to Birmingham, now from Dudley, would any of you consider that to be traveling? Probably nobody here would consider going to Birmingham from Dudley to be traveling. They would consider it to be a small journey, but they wouldn't pack a suitcase for it and live in a hotel and, you know, shorten their prayers and so on and so forth. They wouldn't consider it to be traveling. If you were to travel to London, then now we might get 50-50. Some people might say, yeah, if I was going to London, I'm, I'm traveling. I would consider myself to be traveling. If you were flying to Paris, almost everybody would say, yeah, now I'm traveling. I'm, you know, I have a suitcase with me and I'm acting like a traveler. 
So in general, the, probably the closer of the opinions to the sunnah is that whatever is known by the people as traveling is traveling. Whatever you understand in yourself to be traveling is traveling. But in general, if that's a difficult opinion for you to understand, or if you struggle to understand when you're traveling or when you're not, then just keep it at about 40 miles and beyond there, you can consider yourself to be traveling, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so now we're in Ramadan and you've decided that you wish to travel. Then there are two types of traveling. Traveling in which you're expecting to find fasting difficult, and traveling in which you're expecting to find fasting quite easy. For example, you may be traveling to London, and when you get to London, you're going to be staying with uh, your friends or your relatives, you have a place there, and you know that the iftar is gonna be prepared for you, and everything is ready, and you think, well actually, that's quite easy for me. That's not difficult for me to fast when it, when I'm because I'm only just going to jump in the car an hour and a half down the road. I'll be there. Someone's going to make iftar for me. No problem. This is when fasting is easy. In another case, you think fasting is going to be quite difficult. So you you, you start and you think, Subhanallah. I think you know it, it, I'm going to be traveling to a place. I don't know where I'm going to stay. I don't know what I'm going to eat for iftar. I don't know. So it might be more difficult for you. If you think that fasting is going to be easy for you, it is better for you to fast, but not obligatory for you to fast. As long as you are traveling, it is permissible for you to break your fast. Even if you are traveling with someone who is fanning your face and you know, you're, you're just sat down relaxed in the car or on the plane, if you are traveling, it is permissible for you to break your fast. But if it's easy for you to fast, it's better for you to fast than it is for you to break your fast. If it's difficult for you to fast, it's better for you to break your fast than it is for you to fast. Because Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't want things to be difficult for you. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants things to be easy for you and not to be difficult. And this ayah was revealed regarding fasting. In the ayat of fasting in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah wants things to be easy for you and doesn't want things to be difficult. So we understand with the traveler, as long as you are traveling, it is permissible for you to break your fast. But where, when is it recommended? If it's difficult for you to fast, it's recommended for you to break it. If it's, if it's easy for you to fast, it's recommended for you to keep it. That simple. Everyone okay with the issue of traveling? And the next issue comes under what happens if you have began fasting in the morning and then you begin traveling? Of course, you can't break your fast until you start traveling. You can't, for example, say, okay, today I'm going to go to Paris at five o'clock in the afternoon, so I'll just break my fast from Fajr time. While you're in your city, you need to keep your fast. But you can break your fast as soon as you go beyond the city boundary. Okay, now you guys know better what that is for Dudley, but generally it's where the buildings stop and you go into open land. Okay, so if you guys are, if the buildings are completely attached between here and Birmingham, then you might wait until you got out of Birmingham as well. If there's a gap where Dudley clearly finishes and there's like nothing and then Birmingham starts, then as soon as you leave the boundary of Dudley and you've left where the houses stop and it goes into open land, then as long as you're intending to travel, you're aiming to go that distance 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles, then you can break your fast if you wish. And of course, you can keep your fast if you wish. And there's no harm in either. The Prophet ﷺ allowed some of the companions to keep their fast and some of them broke their fast. So there's no difficulty for you. If you're traveling, you want to break your fast, you may break it. If you want to keep it, you may keep it. It's better to keep it if it's easy. It's better to break it if it's hard. And you can break it as soon as you pass beyond the city boundary, which generally is where the houses stop and you get into open land. And this is where the companions would break their fast when they wanted to. Of course, if you break your fast when you're traveling, you need to make up for that fast. But you don't need to pay anything. You don't need to do any expiation. You don't need to do any istighfar because you haven't done something that's haram. It's completely allowed for you. All you need to do is to keep a total of the number of days and to make up for those days once Ramadan has completed. And when you do make up for those days, when Ramadan is completed, of course, you should make up for them early because you want to get them in before the six days of Shawwal, inshallah, if you're able. 
If you are able, it's much better for you to complete them before the six days of Shawwal uh, begin. So it's very important if you are able that you make them up nice and quickly so that they don't end up coming until the next Ramadan and so that you're able to get out of the disagreement about whether you can fast the six days of Shawwal when you still have days owed from Ramadan or not. So the easier thing to do is what? Make them up a couple of days after Eid make them up one, two days, then start your six from Shawwal, finish your six from Shawwal, and then you're done for the year. And it's written for you as though you fasted uh, the entire year. So that is the issue of traveling. Now we come to the issue of sickness. Again, the issue of sickness broadly is exactly the same as the issue of traveling. In the sense that if you're not very well and you can keep your fast, you should keep it. If you can But if, you don't, if you're not feeling very well And you can't And you're finding it difficult to keep your fast Don't keep it Don't make things difficult Allah doesn't like things to be difficult for you He likes things to be easy for you So don't feel guilty if you're feeling sick You're feeling unwell You've got a severe headache And you're just really feeling rough And you're saying look I, I really need to eat Especially when there's a fear That your sickness is going to get worse Then you should break your fast but when it's easy for you, everyone gets a mild headache in Ramadan. Everyone feels a bit hungry in Ramadan. Everyone sometimes feels a little bit sick in the first few days, especially with the long days of the summer uh, that we have now in the UK. So in this case, you should complete your fast because it's not something that should stop you from fasting. But if it gets very severe and you feel very, very ill, especially if you have other medical conditions that it's likely to complicate, then of course you should break your fast and make up for it in another time when it's easier for you, okay? So that's something. Now we come to those people who are unable to fast in Ramadan because of sickness. And in general, what we need for this is we need a Muslim doctor of reliable uh, standing to testify this for you, either in a general sense such as some doctors will say, everyone who has type so-and-so of diabetes should not fast. Everyone who has a heart condition such and such should not fast. Everyone who has such and such an illness should not fast. Or he says to you specifically, your condition, I don't recommend for you to fast. Okay, so we're talking about someone who can't fast. Another example of someone who can't fast because of sickness is the example of someone who needs to take medicine. Anything that goes beyond your throat breaks the fast. Okay? Anything that goes beyond your throat breaks the fast. That includes paracetamol, even if you swallow it dry, and any other tablets. The only tablets that don't break your fast are the ones that you put under your tongue and they are absorbed by the veins and the, uh, and the uh, vessels that run under the tongue. And the reason these don't break the fast is that they are the same as al madmada. And al madmada is when you put the water in your mouth for wudu and you swill it around and spit it out. This doesn't break the fast because of course you make wudu during Ramadan, even though some of the water is absorbed. Anyone will tell you when you put water in your mouth, some of that water is absorbed by the cells in the mouth, some of the water is absorbed into the body, but it doesn't break the fast. What breaks the fast is what goes down beyond the throat. Again, what goes beyond the throat deliberately in terms of uh, whether it's food or drink or medicine or anything else. Now, if you're taking tablets, your doctor may well be able to prescribe you those tablets in the night instead of the day. And you should push your doctor for this. If he says, no, you have to take your tablets three times a day. Say, look, how about I take my tablets at half past nine, half past 12, half past two, or something like that. He may say to you yes, and he may say to you no. If he says to you no, I'm sorry, it's too short, the space is not long enough, you need to take these tablets, again, push the doctor and say, look, I want to fast. Are they really necessary? Is it really going to cause me some real harm? Or is it just you know, going to make me have a bit of an unsettled stomach or something like that? Can I manage it or not? And if he says no, I'm sorry, it's very important you take them, you need to take them, and you can't take them at night, then you are from these people who are unable to fast because of sickness, okay? You're unable to fast because of sickness. Now, those people who are unable to fast because of sickness, we divide them into two types. Those people who think 
or it is thought that inshallah they're going to get better. So let's say for example, you have uh, an illness, you've had surgery and you need antibiotics. And the doctor says to you, these antibiotics, you can't take them at night, you're gonna have to take them during the day. Inshallah ta'ala, after you finish taking those antibiotics for 10 days or 20 days or 30 days, inshallah you're gonna get better and you're gonna be able to fast later on. So in this case, you're from those people who are able to fast later. But there are some people who have sicknesses that you never believe they're going to be able to fast. Such as certain types of diabetes, certain types of heart conditions, they're never going to be able to fast. Doesn't matter winter, summer, doesn't matter whether it's whatever time, however long or short, they're not going to be able to fast. Those people who are not going to be able to fast, they're sick and they're not going to be able uh, to uh, fast, then those people, you, uh, those people, it is better for them that you, uh, that they give a kafara, they feed one poor person for every day that they were unable to fast. So if Ramadan was 29 days, then they feed that number of poor people. And this is the expiation for them not being able to fast. But this expiation shouldn't be used by people who are going to get better. As for the people who are going to get better, inshallah, they don't pay anything. All they do is they make up their fast when they're better. Even if they're going to get better, and even if the doctor says, look, you're not very well, but I think you could manage fasting in the winter months. I think you could manage a short fast. You're okay probably with that. Then fair enough. Don't fast in the month of Ramadan if the doctor says you're not able and it's going to cause you some harm. And make the time up when the fasts are shorter if that's what the doctor says you're able to do. But of course, there are going to be some people who cannot make up their fasts. They're never going to get any better, not in the winter and not in the summer. And those people, inshallah ta'ala, we, 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 they, what they are required to do is to feed a person for every day that they are unable uh, to fast. And this is their expiation. In, and of course, a person should be fed by what is considered to be the norm in the country that you're in. So whatever is the norm, if, if you're feeding, let's say, for example, you know, for you guys, the norm is you know, say for example, curry and rice or chapati and rice and it comes to a certain amount generally you would have a meal, then that's the amount that you should pay to feed a person who, and ideally if you look for someone who is in need in this country, it's better inshallah. But if of course most people in this country get an iftar who need it, then inshallah you can look to give, uh, to give those abroad. So this is an example of what to do when you're sick. So we said with regard to the sick people, there are people who are never going to get any better. They need to pay to feed a poor person. And there are people who, are, inshallah, are going to get better. Those people must just delay their fasting until they are better and they don't need to pay for anything. Okay, and likewise, we said with regard to sickness, ask your doctor, can you take the tablets in the evening? If the doctor says you can't, then you need to take them during the day if they are critical or important to your health. And of course, there are some diseases and sicknesses that we know that the person cannot fast, certain types of severe diabetes, certain heart conditions and whatever, where the doctor will say to you, doesn't matter what you do, you can't fast, and those people, they pay uh, to feed a poor person for every day that they don't fast. Okay, so we've gone through the sick person, and we've gone through the traveler. Now we come to the issue of the uh, the the, the uh, menses, the women who are on their menses, or childbirth. And the two, we're not going to make any difference because realistically in the Sharia, there isn't a great deal of difference between the two. The two are, uh, for, for the point of fasting, one and the same. The first thing that it's important to note is that the woman, if she's going to fast, she must be pure before the time for Fajr begins uh, and she must have made her intention to fast at that time. So if she becomes pure, it's not ne necessary that she makes ghusl before Fajr, but she must have stopped bleeding completely. And if she has a sign that her menses end, some women do and some don't, some have a sign that their menses end by some, uh, like a white uh, discharge that comes, some women have that, some don't. But when they know their menses have ended and it's before Fajr, then they complete the fasting for that day. 
If they bleed any time during the day, including 30 seconds before the Adhan of Maghrib, their fast is gone for the day and they must fast another day to make up for it. So it's not to be said that, or I, I, there was only a minute left until Maghrib and it's okay, I can complete my fast. We say no, if you have started your menses, even if it is only 30 seconds before Maghrib comes, you ha scrap, scrap that day off the list and you have to make up for that day. Likewise, childbirth uh, is the same issue. If the woman uh, delivers the baby 10 minutes before Maghrib, and then obviously she will begin to bleed, in this case, she has to make up for that day uh, in terms of fasting. So one thing that is very important to talk about when we talk about menses is to differentiate between menses and what we call istihada. Istihada is what we would call in English irregular bleeding. Irregular bleeding. And that is bleeding that is not from menses. Okay? And what it is, it's an illness that causes a woman to bleed from down below. And it is similar to menses, but it differs from menses in a number of things. First of all, istihada is continuous generally. Menses is for usually between 7 and 10 days, roughly up to 14 days in a month. And it comes at a specific time and it finishes at a specific time. Usually the blood of menses is thick and dark, almost black in color, and it has a very, very bad smell to it. Istihada, the Prophet ﷺ said, this is only a vein. It is fresh blood, just like the blood that you would cut from your hand or your finger. And it is blood that usually is continuous and it doesn't stop. So it doesn't stop for one day or two days or three. It continues the whole month. And the reason why it's so important is that there are some women who don't differentiate. And so they don't fast. But the ruling of istihada is that she should fast and she should pray. Okay, so when she has irregular bleeding that is not from the menses, she should fast and she should pray. The easiest way to tell the difference between menses and between irregular bleeding is that menses, the blood will be very clearly different. It should be th dark, probably clotted, and it should have a bad smell to it. That is generally the ruling of menses. The blood of istihada should generally be fresh. It should be thin and, and it should be red in color, like the blood that when you would cut your hand, and generally it wouldn't stop. So if she can tell the difference by the blood, then whenever she has the fresh blood, then this she should fast. And whenever she has the menses blood, she should refrain from fasting. That is if she can tell the difference. But there are some women who can't tell the difference. For, for two months, three months, four months, six months, she's bleeding and she doesn't stop. And she can't tell the difference. So what must she do? Very simple. If she knew the date of her period normally, so she says, normally I start on the 7th of the month and I finish on the 15th of the month, for example. Then she should keep those days as the days of her period and she should stop fasting during those days. And she should fast the rest of the days even if she is bleeding. If she didn't know because she was too young to have a fixed day of her period, she doesn't know, then she can go by the closest family member to her. So her mother, her aunt, her elder sister, for example, who has a particular day, let's say she has from the 1st until the 10th, then she should refrain from fasting from the 1st until the 10th, and the rest of the days she should fast. Of course, when she prays, what she needs to do is she needs to clean herself before every prayer and make wudu for every single prayer, just like the person who suffers from uh, urinary incontinence. He, you know, you keep, they can't control their bladder. Similar kind of issue. But it's very important with istihada, istihada does not stop you from fasting. It's very, very important. And the easiest way to tell is the blood. And most women will know for a fact. She will say, this is not my period, this is just blood. I know this. And that's fine. But if she doesn't know, then she goes back to her normal monthly cycle and she, she stops fasting during her monthly cycle and she continues to fast at the end of her monthly cycle or she goes by a near family member, and this is the issue of istihaba. It's very, very important, Ya Ikhwan, because a lot of women suffer from this. It's an illness, it happens to people from time to time, and the problem is they don't know that they should be fasting during it. Likewise, istihaba also counts child bleeding that takes longer than 40 days. Let's say the sister gave birth two months ago, 60 days ago, and she's still bleeding. Whatever happens after 40 days is istihada. 
Once the 40th day comes, she prays and she fasts. Even if, it's, if the bleeding continues for three, four, five, six months, once the 40th day is over, she should pray and fast and consider this to be irregular bleeding. So irregular bleeding is something that you must be aware of and you have to teach your families if your wives and your family members suffer from this problem that maybe, inshallah, if a sister knows she suffers, she should, could ask for more information uh, from someone later on in more detail, but just to give people an idea that there is such a thing as irregular bleeding that happens in childbirth and it happens relating to the monthly period, which is in which she would fast and she would pray as normal, even though she would be bleeding and likewise she would not be prevented from having relations with her husband at that time either. Good. So we've covered now the issue of the traveler, we've covered the sick. And we've covered the women's issues with regard to menses and childbirth. Now we come on to two more uh, issues, which is the issue of the pregnant women and those who are breastfeeding. Again, with regard to pregnant women and those who are breastfeeding, it depends on the woman and it depends on what she feels and it depends on her medical advice as well. Some women will be pregnant and they will fast the whole of Ramadan and they don't find any problem in it whatsoever. And some women will not be able to fast Ramadan at all. Some of them will feel that if the pregnancy has reached a certain stage, they, can, they won't, don't want to fast, or in the early time they want to fast, and some of them the opposite way around. At the end of the day, it is permissible for a woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding, it is permissible for her to break the fast if she wishes. It's up to her to decide whether she thinks she needs to or not. She may say, whenever I fast and I feed the child, I feel the child is screaming, the child is hungry, the child is not settling, and therefore I want to break my fast, no problem. She may say, I've fasted before and I have no problem feeding the children. So it's entirely up to her. Of course, more than that comes the issue of medical advice. If the doctor says, I don't think you should fast, then of course you should heed the advice of the doctor because the doctor may have other issues in mind, medical issues, medical history. So for the woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding, then for her it is, uh, it is uh, permissible for her if she wishes to break her fast. And of course, if she breaks her fast, she would make up for the uh, fast uh, that uh, she misses. However, what some of the scholars differentiate between two different situations in this regard. Two different situations in this regard. One is when a woman fears for her own health. She's pregnant or breastfeeding and she fears for her own health, her own health. And one is when she fears for the health of the child only. I'm fine, but I fear for the health of my child. Some of the scholars make no difference between them. They say there's no difference between this one and this one. But some of them make a difference between them. And if you make a difference, that's, a little, that's not a bad thing to do. Okay? What they say is, they say that the woman who only fears for her child... She only fears for her child. She should not only make up the day, but she should also pay to feed a poor person. Why? Because they say that she did not have a reason of being sick herself. She only broke her fast because of somebody else. So they say in this instance, she should give kafara, she should give an expiation of feeding one poor person, and she should make up the fast. Some of the scholars say she doesn't need to. What I would say to you is there's no harm in doing it just to be safe, to make sure that her fast is accepted in the sight of Allah. That if she says, especially if she's breastfeeding and she says, me, I'm fine, I can fast, but I'm frightened the children will become sick. She's frightened for someone else, not herself. It's better for her. I'm not going to say it's wajib, but it's better for her if she pays to feed a poor person and makes up the fast when she's no longer feeding as well. There is one more issue that relates to the issues of uh, childbirth, uh, so that relates to the issues of pregnancy and breastfeeding, and that is what happens if she's pregnant one Ramadan, then she's breastfeeding, then she's pregnant, then she's breastfeeding, then she's pregnant, then she's... So she goes six, seven, eight Ramadan, and she doesn't uh, fast. 
Does she still have to make up those fasts? In this case, the ulama, they say, she does not make up the fasts. What she does, she pays for a poor person for every day and, and finishes with it. Why? Because it would reach a point where she would not be able to make them up. Eight years, six years, five years, four years. It's too much for a person to do. You would ask her to almost fast the whole year. It's, not, it's very, very difficult for a person to do. So what we would say, one year, two years, three years, no problem, inshallah. But if it gets to the point of, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, years where, because some women are like this, they're breastfeeding one, pregnant, and so on and so forth for, the, for a large period, 10 years in a row, seven years in a row. And in this case, it's not possible for her to make up the fasts. If it reaches a number where it becomes ridiculous, then it's not possible for her to make up the fasts. And she should act like the person who was permanently sick and pay for one day for every fast that she missed and she doesn't have to worry. But as long as she's able, she says, I missed two years, I was pregnant and then I was feeding my child and then I stopped and I was able and so she can make up two months. It's not difficult, inshallah. Uh, but you know, more than she, if it gets to a point where it's more than she's able, then she, should, uh, she can just pay instead of fasting. Let's just go down the list and make sure that we've covered all of the individuals that we were, uh, we were uh, talking about. One of them that is mentioned in the list of people is the one who fasts, who breaks his fast on the first day of Ramadan because he didn't know that Ramadan had started. Okay? Somebody who didn't know Ramadan had started and they break their fast, this person does not have to pay. They only simply have to make up the fast because they weren't sinful. They didn't know that Ramadan had started. They weren't aware of it. And this is true for some people. Sometimes people live away from the Muslims. Sometimes uh, people may, for example, that day their internet got cut off or whatever, and they weren't you know, in a community like this where they could ask people. They were far away. Maybe in this case, it does happen to some people in some places in the world that they missed the first day of Ramadan because they didn't know that it was Ramadan. This person, they don't have to pay anything. They just simply have to make up the day. Okay, then we come to the issues of we're gonna we're gonna come to now the issues of what breaks the fast, and then when we come to the issues of what breaks the fast, we can then look at a couple of other instances like the one who deliberately eats in Ramadan or the one who has intimate relations during the day in Ramadan and what that person has to do. Okay, so what are the things that break our fast? What are the things that break our fast? What breaks our fast? First of all. Uh, we'll go through them one by one as they are listed here. The first one is the menses. We said whenever the menses happens to a woman, she breaks her fast, even if it's only 30 seconds before Maghrib. Okay? What happens if she doesn't know? What happens if she goes to the bathroom half an hour after Maghrib and she doesn't know whether she broke her fast or not? Very simple. Islam asks you only to act upon what you know. Islam asks you, only asks you to act upon what you know, okay? So if, you're, if she's certain that she started to bleed before Maghrib, she has to make up the day. If she doesn't know, she went to the bathroom 10 minutes after Maghrib, she found she had started and she says, I don't know whether I did or I didn't, but I've got no evidence, there's nothing there to show me that I did, then she can keep that fast because Islam only asks you to act upon yaqeen. Likewise, if you don't know, did I break my wudu or not? But you remember making it, you don't have to make your wudu again. Because Islam only asks you to do what you are certain of. Okay, Islam only asks you to do what you're certain of. And we said likewise, uh, the childbirth. We said of course that, you know, when a, a person passes away, if a person passes away before completing the day of fasting, then that day of fasting is an obligation that that person, that the, the person would uh, possibly fulfill for them if they wished to do so. Uh, deliberately breaking the fast, uh, being uncertain about breaking the fast. And now we come to the first one that is of interest to us, the issue of vomiting. Vomiting does not break the fast if it is accidental, i.e. if you didn't intend to do it. But what breaks the fast is putting fingers down the throat to vomit or drinking salt water in order to vomit or drinking an emetic 
medicine that causes you to vomit, all of these break the fast. But as for just feeling sick and throwing up, this doesn't break the fast. Okay, so for example, if there's a woman in the, early age, in the early stages of pregnancy and she's being sick, it's up to her, she can still fast because as long as she's not being sick deliberately, i.e. she's not putting her fingers down her throat or she's not swallowing something to make herself throw up, there's nothing to break the fast in vomiting. What breaks the fast in vomiting is deliberately causing yourself to vomit. Okay? Okay. Uh, if you... Uh, if you um, uh, were to uh, ejaculate through del if, uh, deliberately, i.e. if someone was to look at a woman uh, repeatedly until he was to ejaculate, or if he was to touch himself, or if he was to have a relation with his wife, even if that was not through uh, intercourse, but if that was just through touching each other or kissing each other or something similar, this breaks the fast. Okay, this breaks the fast. What doesn't break the fast is a wet dream. So a wet dream does not break the fast. So if you went to sleep in the daytime in Ramadan, it was accidental, it doesn't break the fast. What breaks the fast is deliberate, is something which is deliberate, similar to vomiting, something which is deliberate. So either through kissing, through touching, through looking repeatedly, this breaks uh, the fast. Uh, likewise, uh, we said that uh, intercourse breaks the fast. And finally, we say the one that is, uh, the one that is uh, significant for us is that whatever reaches the, the lower part of the throat and goes into the stomach breaks the fast uh, in terms of whether that is medicine, whether that is food, whether that is drink, even if it has no nutritional value, okay? Even if it has no nutritional value, okay? So if you were to swallow... I don't know, mud, and it was to go beyond your throat, this would break your fast, okay? Tablets would break your fast, even if they have no nutritional value. Where does nutritional value come in? Nutritional value comes in when we talk about injections, okay? Injections don't break your fast if they have no nutritional value, okay? Example, vaccination. Vaccination against measles or flu or something like that. It doesn't have any nutritional value, okay? But for example, something that has nutritional value is injecting yourself with insulin, glucose, those kind of things that diabetics in inject in themselves because these have, these are similar to food or they produce a similar effect to food, okay? So these have covered the main things that we need to know. What doesn't break your fast is of course what goes down your throat accidentally. Okay, give you some examples. You have a nosebleed at night and you wake up and you've swallowed some of the, the blood. This doesn't break your fast because it wasn't deliberate. Likewise, whatever saliva goes down your throat naturally, it doesn't break your fast. But you shouldn't really be, you know, sort of, if you had a nosebleed, you wouldn't be tipping your head back to try to get more of the blood down the throat. But whatever went down the throat accidentally, it doesn't break your fast. Likewise, what doesn't break your fast is accidental Eating, when you forget, especially in the first few days of Ramadan, you might completely forget and you start to eat, but you must, t as soon as you remember, you must spit out whatever is in your mouth. You have to spit it out and you have to uh, clean out your mouth with water. There's nothing wrong with putting water in your mouth, but of course it mustn't go beyond the throat and that's why we don't gargle in wudu when we are fasting. And of course, the last thing that we need to mention uh, with regard to these things is the issue of a person who uh, was to deliberately break his fast in Ramadan and what they would have to do. If a person deliberately broke his fast in Ramadan, he only has to make tawbah and to make it up. He doesn't have to pay anything. He just has to make tawbah, repent and make it up, except for the one who breaks it through intercourse. The one who breaks it through intercourse, this person has to do the kafara of intercourse in Ramadan. And this one is, uh, this one is the one that is mentioned in the hadith from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anh, that a man came and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I had intercourse with my wife while I was fasting. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, do you have find that you are able to free a slave? He said, no. He said, are you able to fast two months one, continuously without breaking your fast, i.e. 
day after day after day after day for 60 days. He said no. He said, uh, are you, uh, he said no. Uh, and then the, the Prophet ﷺ said, then are you able to feed 60 poor people? He said, there is nobody more poor in Medina than me. And so the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he gave him from the sadaqah. So in this hadith, we find that if a person was to fall into this uh, sin of committing intercourse in Ramadan, then they must, if they are able to free a slave, they must do so. If they are not because they can't find any slaves to free, then they must fast two whole months continuously. If they are unable to do so for health reasons, only then are they allowed to fix, feed 60 poor people. And if they cannot feed 60 poor people, then they must do to the best of their ability, as the person did, to give whatever charity that they were able to give to the extent that they can do so. The only other issue that we wanted to cover is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said that if one of you is, the wording of which is similar to, if one of you has a glass in his hand or something in his hand, do not let him put it, and he hears the adhan, do not let him put it down until he has, uh, until he has uh, satisfied himself from it. In this we say that there are two extremes and two problems when it comes to uh, stopping eating in the morning. One is a bid'ah that people do when they stop eating very early, deliberately, in order to say, I want to be sure that my fast is accepted. This is a bid'ah and it's haram and it earns you sin. You must not do this. If you stop eating early because you fell asleep or you stop eating because you didn't want to eat anymore and you were full, that's a different thing. But someone who says, I stop eating 10 minutes before the adhan so that I can be sure that my fast is accepted, this is a bid'ah that was not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and is something which is haram for the person to do. Rather, the sunnah is that if you wish to eat, you should continue eating until the adhan and as for the time of the adhan it depends on who the mu'addin is if the mu'addin you know for a fact he gives the adhan one or two minutes early then do not put your drink down until you have drank what is in your hand and then put it down so if you know the mu'addin gives the adhan a minute early finish your drink finish your mouthful and put it down if you know that the mu'addin gives the adhan after fajr has come in, then as soon as you hear the adhan, you must put down your food and drink, and you must not eat anything from it because the time for fasting has started. Okay, so in general, you should be eating right up to the time that you hear the adhan. If you know the mu'addin gives the adhan a minute or so early or a few seconds early, then you can finish your mouthful and put it down, inshaAllah ta'ala. And of course, this adhan is the adhan for fajr and not the adhan that wakes you up for tahajjud. Yeah, the adhan that is the adhan for the fajr prayer. So what we want to see is people eating right up until the adhan. Unless, of course, they're full or they don't want to eat. That's not a problem. But what we don't want to see is the masjid 20 minutes, half an hour before the adhan, clearing up the food. Nobody eat. Now nobody eat. The adhan's coming in 20 minutes because this is something which is not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to delay stopping eating and to quickly break the fast at Maghrib. The same thing goes for people who take 20, 30 minutes after Maghrib before they eat. And they say, I want to be sure my fast is accepted. No, as soon as you hear the Adhan, break your fast. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, this Ummah will continue to have good in it as long as it qu quickly, as long as they rush quickly to break the fast. That is more than what we have time for uh, in terms of all of the time that we've uh, taken up so far. And Jazakumullahu uh, khairan for you guys listening. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll take time for some questions now quite quickly because uh, time is a little bit, take a little bit longer. Hopefully, inshallah, that gave you a bit of an introduction to some of the issues and hopefully that simple, simplified some things for you. I will make a little warning, a note of warning, and say to you guys that the, 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 it, there's no doubt that in all issues of fiqh there will be disagreements. And not everybody will agree, and not every scholar or student of knowledge will agree with everything that I've said. And at the end of the day, you're required to go to the person who you think is the most knowledgeable and to ask them until you get an answer that you think has evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and then to implement it, inshaAllah ta'ala. So whatever is correct from this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a mercy and a blessing. And whatever is in error is from myself and from the shaitan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakallah, Shaykh. I've had a, a dozen or so uh, questions text through to me, um, but I will take some questions from the floor first. Um, it just, um, I understand that they, um, if 
blood come, you know, forcibly, you know, it's not beyond your hands, it, it's okay, it doesn't break your fast, but um, what if you actually um, go on for a blood test and you want to have some blood out, does that break the fast? Okay, the question is uh, a blood test or giving blood. Not, neither of these uh, break your fast, inshallah. The only uh, thing with regard to blood you need to worry about is deliberately taking blood past your throat. That's the only thing you need to be worried about in blood. Accidental blood that goes down your throat doesn't, and neither does giving blood, inshallah, break your fast. So there's no concern there, inshallah. Okay, uh, some of these questions may um, well have been dealt with within the talk, but I think for purposes of clarification, if we can run through them, inshallah. Women that are heavily pregnant, are they excused from fasting? We said with regard to pregnancy that there's no hard and fast rule. It's up to the woman. If she wishes to fast, she can fast. And if she wishes to break her fast, she can break it. And of course, if she's advised medically to break it, she should break it, inshallah. And do they have to pay the kafara for every day not fasted whilst pregnant? We said that regarding the kafara, it depends on whether or not they are fearful of their child or themselves. If they're fearful of themselves getting sick, they don't have to pay the kafara because their example is like the example of a sick person. And if they are simply fearful for the child and they themselves are fine, then it's better for them to pay the kafara. I know that some of the ulama say there's no evidence for this and I respect that opinion but I think it's safer for them to pay the kafara, considering it's a very small amount, for them to get out of the disagreement and to make sure that they are you know, within the realm of, of the fasting being correct, inshallah. Okay, I've had a couple of questions here, so I'll try and amalgamate those questions. And they're around the theme of starting Ramadan when the rest of your family may be starting Ramadan on a different day because they follow a different masjid. Uh, and the same when the issue comes to Eid and there's a conflict in terms of when the day of Eid is. What is the general advice in terms of dealing with that situation? Okay, my advice is to differentiate between two circumstances. If there's a circumstance where you know for a fact that the masjid is using a system that is not Islamically correct, we have a masjid in Newcastle, and I certainly in previous years I have known for sure, this year I don't know, but in previous years I've known for sure, that they gather about two days or three days into Ramadan, ten days into Ramadan, and decide when Eid is going to be when it's convenient for them with their shops and their restaurants to open and close. This is not a valid means to determine Ramadan. If it's this case, ignore them because it's not, a, it's not permissible for you to follow them. If they are using a genuine method to calculate the beginning and the end of Ramadan, like local moon sighting, worldwide moon sighting, or following Saudi Arabia, for example, then this is absolutely fine. And you should, you, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with the family starting on different days if that's how it works out. If you can start on the same day, alhamdulillah. But if the masjids are using a valid method and then they are not, uh, and, and you know the method is valid, you're happy it is, then it, it, there's nothing wrong with you starting on different days if that's what you want to do. And that's just like starting fasting at different times. Some people will fast in Newcastle, we might fast half an hour earlier than you guys fast here or half an hour later than you guys fast here. It's not a problem, inshallah ta'ala. The problem comes when they're using a method that is not legitimate in the sharia. Okay, such as determining it with uh, something which is, uh, which is uh, just based on desires or is not based on the sharia in any way. Okay. If you don't get up for sahur, is there anything you can do and do you still have to fast? If you don't get up for suhoor, of course you have to fast, no doubt. As for what you can do, the only thing that you can do to relieve yourself is to make wudu. That's the only thing that you can do, is to make wudu. And when you make wudu, of course, you can do madmada, which is to put water into your mouth, swill it around and spit it back out. You can't swallow any down your throat, but this will give you some relief. Doing wudu will at least give you a little bit of relief. But you have to complete the fast. Can you have an injection when fasting, for example, if you have a knee problem and you need the injection in the knee for pain relief? You need to ask whether the injection has any nutritional value, whether it's similar to food like insulin or like uh, glucose or something like that. If it does, then it breaks the fast. You can have the injection if you need it, but of course it will break your fast. But the majority of injections don't have any food value, any nutritional value, um, and they're just, especially if it's injected into the muscle, then in this case, uh, there's nothing wrong with having that injection and it doesn't break the fasting show. Okay. Any further questions relating to the fasting? I've got a couple of questions here relating to a different topic. 
Yes, brother. I think very briefly, because the time is, is pretty short, the best way to prepare yourself for Ramadan is first of all to realize the purpose of Ramadan. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe fasting has been made obligatory for you, like it was obligatory for those who came before you, so that you might increase in obedience to Allah and decrease in disobedience to Allah. So in preparation for Ramadan, you need to be prepared to be more obedient to Allah and less disobedient to Allah. To do more sunan and to do less haram and to do less disliked actions. It's very important that in this you put the fard ahead of everything. Unfortunately, there are some people, qaddar Allah, who they pray taraweeh and they don't pray fajr. Or they pray taraweeh and they don't pray dhuhr and asr. This is not accepted from you because taraweeh is a sunnah. It's a recommended action. It's not an obligation. Okay, so what I need, what we want to see is people praying their five daily prayers and taraweeh, inshaAllah. But if you're going to leave one of them, then leave taraweeh and focus on the five daily prayers because these are those that are obligatory for you. And you can't come close to Allah except by those things that Allah has made obligatory. You can't come close to Allah by the optional deeds. So focus on the obligatory. As for the optional deeds, things like taraweeh, things like uh, standing in prayer, things like reciting a lot of the Quran, these are all things you need to be focused on in Ramadan and memorizing and acting upon it and learning it. As for the end of Ramadan, then what you need to focus on is continuing your efforts after Ramadan. Because the sign that someone's deeds have been accepted is generally what? That they are given the ability to continue doing good deeds after that. Okay, so if you see people are continuing doing good deeds after that, then inshallah ta'ala, this is something, this is a sign that their fasting has been accepted. And if you see someone disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of Eid, and stopping praying and going out clubbing and drinking and whatever, then know this person ha had no fast. Allah Azza wa Jal did not accept their fast. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had he accepted their fasting, he would have given them the ability to do good on the day of Eid. So your day of Eid is a test for you. If your day of Eid is a day of obedience, your fasting has been accepted inshallah. And if your day of Eid is the worst day of the year for you in disobeying Allah, then this is a sign that your fast has not been accepted. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept our fasts. Yes. No, the Adhan of Fajr, for, for the purpose of fasting, when we say the Adhan of Fajr, we mean the time that Fajr begins. We don't mean necessarily the masjid doesn't get, someone doesn't come in till half an hour afterwards. By the Adhan of Fajr, we mean the time that Fajr begins on the timetable or the time that you see that Fajr begins if you know how to see Fajr from the sky. So we mean the time for Fajr, uh, not the Adhan itself. Like we said that some, uh, some of the people who give the Adhan, they give the Adhan a minute or two early. You can continue to finish your drink in this case, inshallah. Okay. Oh, okay, I have a question relating to prayer. If you're at work and you know you won't have time for the next prayer, can you combine? In general, you shouldn't combine. In general, you shouldn't combine. And I want to discourage people from combining between the prayers for no reason whatsoever. Make an effort to make time to pray, especially in the summer. It's almost impossible to understand how someone would not be able to pray the prayers on time. But if there is the odd occasion, and I say the odd occasion, not every day, the odd occasion when it's difficult for you to pray if because of an appointment or because of a big problem at work or because you fear the time is going to go, then you can combine between the prayers even if you're not a traveler, inshallah ta'ala. But combining between the prayers should be occasional and it should not be every single day. Likewise, if because of the summer it's very late and you feel very tired one day and you're falling asleep, you can combine between Maghrib and Isha. But don't do so every single day because this is, and especially don't leave the masjid empty for one of the prayers, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, Sheikh, you've answered the next question was regarding combining the Maghrib and the Isha prayer if you're going to work the next day. I said that, inshallah, regarding uh, this, that if a person does it occasionally, there's no harm in this, but it should not be done on a regular basis. No regular practice. Uh, Brother Rashid. Child 
portray uh, or combine the two together until it finds it easier when it goes back to nine o'clock? The question is regarding a child who is y younger than the age of puberty who is praying. Yes, they can combine permanently because it's not obligatory for them to pray the five daily prayers on time anyway. It's obviously the, the older they get, the more recommended it is until they reach the age of puberty, but it's not an obligation. So there's no harm at all in a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old combining Maghrib and Isha every day. But the problem is when an adult does it every single day, this is, seems to me to be inappropriate. But if you do it, I mean, I probably do it maybe once or twice a week if I get really, really tired or I've been traveling. Combine them, no problem, inshallah, because combining the prayers allowed at a time of need. Not a necessity, but just need, just you have a need to do it. But it shouldn't be a practice whereby the masjid is empty for Isha and the only person here is just one person who comes. Try and sleep in the day and, and stay up for it, inshallah, but the children, there's no, no problem in it, inshallah.